Welcome back, everybody, to the Don't Go Out There Horror Movie Review Podcast, uh, partner with the Roll Up Network. Just want to thank all our fans and listeners. I really appreciate it. Uh, I'm super excited for this awesome interview we have. We have the pleasure of having another legend of the business with credit spanning a decades-long career. Known for her roles in TV and movies alike, including the one and only Kelly Meeker from Halloween 4, The Return of Michael Myers, writer, actress, producer, and director, Ms. Kathleen Kenmont. Thank you so much for joining us. How are you doing? I'm great. Thank you, Nico. What a lovely intro. Very cool. Uh, yes, ma'am. Uh, thank you so much for doing this. Uh, we like to start all of our interviews by just asking, and we briefly touched on it in the opening, but what is it that got you into acting? Your mom, Abby Dalton, was a TV icon herself, correct? Correct. Uh, she was a wonderful actor that had a really wonderful decades-long career herself, and uh, just going through all of the wonderful things that she did, um, you know, she was a, a huge inspiration to me and many others, for sure. So she gave me the, the fine gift of autonomy, which is the freedom to choose what you want to do without being coerced, manipulated, threatened, uh, controlled. And, and she really gave that to me. She, she really let me decide on my own. So she didn't push me. She encouraged me whatever I wanted to do. And acting was it. So she gave me all the great advice. So I really had a, a great mentor, a great friend, and she happened to be my mom. So I got lucky. Absolutely. That's fantastic. So your first feature film role was in the comedy Hard Bodies. Mm -hmm. you know, going, going from TV, which you were a part of before that, was, was there anything that was a bit of a shock to you or was, was the transition pretty seamless? Uh, I hadn't really done a lot of, I mean, I had done commercials really up until that point because that was really my first real job, uh, getting out of high school, being 18 and having an acting job. Uh, so I, I really didn't have a whole lot to compare it to other than this was going to be my first uh, opportunity to work for four days on a character as opposed to just being a day player on something. Right. And because of that, I, it gave me a little bit more uh, of a voice when it came time for the director to say, hey, you know, all these other girls are topless. Why don't you just do it too? You know, it just seems like so much fun, so natural. I said, <laughs> I said to Mark Griffiths, I said, um, you know what? My character has already said uh, in the dialogue, I'm not taking my clothes off. So why would she do it now? Right. Because the director talked to her. I, I don't think the audience is going to know that. <laughs> <laughs> right. Right. So I think that that was a really big, even though I didn't really know it at the time, I wasn't really aware of like, wow, that's a learning curve. It was it was definitely something that um, kind of stayed with me. Like, I, I remember how good that felt to be uh, justifiably right, because it wasn't scripted that I was to do that. And I wasn't comfortable with that. And it was like that was a, a, a beginning into you know, the entertainment business was just such a, a shark infested ocean that is, right. you know, it's as explored as space or not as explored as space, right. <laughs> really explored. So I, I really was grateful for my mom and, and her sage advice about always sticking up for myself and, and pacing myself. And I think that was a, a very huge piece of actor advice because as actors, you get on the set and you're just so damn excited to have a job and you want to make friends and you want to meet people. And it's just, it's an animated uh, work experience anyway. It feels like you've got a job at the circus, you know, but, <laughs> but the trapeze guy isn't on the trapeze all day long. Um, as an actor, you have to think of yourself like that. Like how long can I actually stay on the high wire for before I really tire out? So, so she, before I ever started, and she said, you know, find a place to settle on the set. Let it be your spot. You know, sure, you can be cool and socialize, but not a lot. Don't do it too much. Just pace yourself. So I thought that was really great advice. It's really good advice for any artist, I think, whatever you're doing, to uh, to right. know that it's you're not there to, like, entertain everybody else. You're there to do a job specifically in front of a camera save yourself <laughs> right. yeah 
So that was, you know, I, I love that. We're memorializing my mom this weekend. She passed away last November. It wasn't due to COVID, but she passed away during COVID. So we really had to wait nine months before we thought it was a safe time to get everyone together. So we chose her birthday, August 15th. And, and now here in LA, it looks like we just missed the window. <laughs> oh, wow. I'm sorry to hear that. I'm sorry to hear that. Yeah, it's pretty brutal. But yeah, um, still going to do it anyway. And hey, you know, if four people die from coming to celebrate my mom's memorial. That's the way, that's the way it goes. <laughs> so like, yeah. I'm so Cheers. sorry to hear about that. <laughs> it, it Last year was very tough on everybody. Um, and Ms. it Kenma, be so. <laughs> right, exactly. Miss yeah. Kim, I know you're probably, you know, questioning to death, but we have to ask you a few things about Halloween 4. You know, it's one of our show's favorite entries in the franchise. Uh, can you just tell us how you got the role of Kelly Meeker? Well, I auditioned, and okay. I knew that it was a, uh, a franchise because it was Halloween 4, and I w everyone was super aware of Halloween the first few. Um, so, yeah, it was it was a big deal. I, I was still so young in the business, though, that I was like, I was going out for so many things constantly all the time. So, you know, at that age and being fresh in the business, everybody wants to see you. So it was it was like, OK, well, there's this one. There's that one. There's that. so it, and it's a numbers game, too, of course. So I ended up getting that one, which was great. I wasn't really. I wasn't really, you know, so aware of like, oh God, I need this job. It was, it was just like, wow, this one would be fun. <laughs> right. Well, that's great. She's mean. <laughs> <laughs> well, that yeah. that that kind of leads me into my next little. It's mostly a comment other than a question, but I have to say, just like one of the first things that I said to my wife, who actually has never seen the Halloween movies, uh, surprisingly, um, was that she always reminded me of you in Halloween Four, and I even I even got her a cops do it by the book shirt and everything. So, <laughs> uh, so just to throw a question in here somewhere, so it's not just crazy. Um, your line in that in the movie, your most famous line, probably "fuck off, Wade." Uh, it was wasn't scripted if i'm correct in saying that correct you're right you're right it would the line was originally uh get lost wade oh okay and we we got that we shot that and uh, i thought the director was going to come over and say great job we're moving on but instead he said uh great job do you mind changing the line and i was like sure whatever you want me to say and uh he said, well, I'd like you to say, fuck off, Wade. The same way you said, get lost, Wade. Just real dry, real flat, real like, he's super annoying. And I said, okay. like And like you guys and everybody else, I mean, it took me like, I said, just give me a couple minutes to laugh. Just maybe five <laughs> minutes. I don't know. This is just, you kind of throw me a curveball because I don't want to do it with a smile. Right. Because it's like, uh, you know. And uh, so it was great. We did it once and it made the film. So that was a really wonderful moment of how uh, beautiful spontaneity is and how flexible we need to be. And you can really only be that flexible when I think you're super prepared. Right. Um, and so I was relaxed, and I think that that's what preparation is, is allows yourself to relax so you don't have to be scrambling and like, oh, my God, how do I look? What's my hair doing? Or, <laughs> you know, you're just like, yeah, you know, and uh, it was great. I think that's probably one uh, set of air quotes that I write on more uh, eight by tens than anything. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. And when I catch you at a con, I'm going to get you to sign something with those air quotes as well. So that'll be Excellent. perfect. <laughs> I think I've even written it on people's skin so they can oh. go get a tattoo. <laughs> oh, wow. <Yeah. laughs> those are the best. Those those signings on skin and they go straight to the parlor. <laughs> that is that's awesome. Um, I, you know, kind of moving on a little bit. Another one of your you know famous roles, Gloria, the Bride of Reanimator. You know, Jeffrey Combs, such a legend himself. But, you know, we've, we've had Robert England and many others on the show, and it always interests us. And, and we've got a lot of feedback about, you know, the questions we ask about the makeup process. You know, your, your character definitely has some extensive makeup effects and prosthetics going on. Can, can you talk a little bit about that process? 
Well, it was a long process. That's for darn sure. It started, we get that a lot. <laughs> yeah, it started around uh, two or three in the morning, and it would be about four to five hours before I would step on the set. And then uh, my set day would start, which would last till, for about 12 hours, and then about three hours to get it all off. So I was really pulling the days that I worked, they were like a full, almost a 24 hour full day, um, which is more than a full day. It's two days. <laughs> <laughs> right, exactly. It's two work days in a shit. I mean, a bit longer because it's like, who does a 12 hour work day other than actors? Um, but then they gave me full 24 hour turnarounds. So I never worked successively, which was really considerate. Especially considering the fact that my skin was getting repeatedly more and more raw. Um, but they took such good care of me and I always felt like a queen and I was the K and B queen. So I had their full attention. They worked on nothing else on that film. I was their focal point. And that was that was great because I always had like, I don't know, four to six men um, at my fingertips, feet, you know, within my eye line, if ever they saw that I needed something. They built a really cool lean-to for me because I couldn't sit. Um, and the, the way that the costume was fabricated is that it, uh, it, it involved several, several, um, uh, uh, body process, um, casts, right. like all of my entire body, my head in various poses, screaming, sleeping, awake, yeah, you know, screaming for 15 minutes and holding a body cast, like, you know, scream position for 15 minutes while the plaster dries is, you know, you have a lot of time to think about, is this what I really want to do with my life? <laughs> You're like, ha, ha, ha I think so. <laughs> <laughs> um, but it it was a, a, an amazing test in patience. They they had a one arm that I slipped into, and it went down one leg, and that was and the body was there, and it was all my, me. So I was like slipping into my own skin, and then they marbleized and put prosthetics on other pieces, and prosthetics up into my neck, the back of my neck, all around my chest. You know, an assemblage of ten different body parts. So. The character in itself was just spasmodic, um, confused emotionally, frightened emotionally, in love emotionally. I mean, because her heart was beating for Dan, you know. <laughs> right. Like, there was I was just like a puppet that's just been like, you know, having a complete seizure. A, a, you know, controlled seizure is really what I thought this character was basically going through was a controlled seizure. So, I, you know, it, it, for an actor, it was like, well, who gets to play this? Uh, being right. five foot ten, skinny blonde girl that's in the bathing suit on the beach. You know, I don't know. It was it was great. I'm, I'm glad that I'm, I've shapeshifted. That's a real compliment to be able to um, not just be seen as one thing, I guess being like a little bit more of a badass about it. Well, you, you brought up your uh, heart beating. So I got to ask about the most famous scene, obviously, about, you know, pulling your own heart out, basically, of your chest. So um, do you remember anything about that scene? I mean, it seems, I mean, it was, it looks very good on film. So it does look very good on film. You're right. And I think that that scene was definitely saved for the end of the shoot because Brian knew that at that point I would literally be ripping my own heart out of my own chest if they didn't have the prosthetic ready with a balloon inside it pumping because I was so tired. I was like, this thing better work. If it's oh. not, I'm going for it, guys. It's going to be one take. Um, but, I, you know, it's it's – it's definitely one of those things that I think we all totally relate to in, in life. Like, is this what you want? Like, what else can I give you? Um, and that was really where, where Brian was coming from. 
uh, from a, a an emotional standpoint as far as like, I know this is going to feel so ridiculous and nobody in, in our human existence has ever really been able to do that. You know, you can't, you, you die before you, so it it doesn't make sense, but to this character, nothing makes sense. And it's like that, that nightmare that we get caught in, in our own minds where, you know, what is real, what isn't real. And, it doesn't matter what's happening in front of you is real it's it's happening too quickly for it to not be real so they put the blood in my eyes i was on those wooden slats with the great light coming up and the smoke and the green and the just you know the end it was just so it was just palpable and you know even when i think about it now i mean i kind of start to sweat a little bit because it was so uncomfortable and my knees were all you know kind of all akimbo just like splayed out and and i can do that with my knees it's no problem but i was doing that for like an hour and they oh, were yeah. really starting to ache. <laughs> <laughs> and i was just like oh my god and they were trying to get that gag to work with the beating heart because there was literally somebody behind me like pumping air into it and it was like <laughs> you know and i was just like trying not to laugh and also <laughs> try, you know and it's like but the but the reality was like I was laughing, you know, so why try to suppress that? You know, so that's what they got really was all the emotion that was really happening to me coming through this goopy ass character who's completely disassembling. And yeah, it was it was pretty iconic. I mean, of all things that I've ever done, that was as raw as it gets. Yeah. Yeah, that's I mean, a very cool way to look at it too. I mean, I've never heard it explained like that. That was that was very awesome. Thank absolutely. you. Absolutely. <laughs> uh, it was worth it then. Absolutely. Miss <laughs> <laughs> uh, Kenma, oh, I'm not sure how much you can talk about it, but it looks like you're, you're finishing up production or close to it on a TV series called Phoenix. Uh, can you tell us a little bit about that, if possible, and your role as Rebecca Stout? Yes, I play a. Um, God, it's so hard to not give anything away about Rebecca. <laughs> She's just a badass, first of all. Um, Phoenix is a, uh, a a woman who has lost her memory. And she's coming back trying to figure out who she is, what she is, what happened. And and this all starts with her walking away from a plane crash and like a big plane crash, like a plane crash where she's the only survivor. And like, how the hell did that happen? And it's just filled with espionage, human trafficking, drugs. I mean, just, you know, pick all the things that we need protection from. (laughs) And uh, that's who these characters are. And uh, it's 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 uh, it's good versus evil. So we like those stories. And it's it's very current. And the, the cast is amazing. Laureen Price is the lead. Uh, she's the Phoenix. Uh, Grace Byers, really wonderful actress, very recognizable from Empire and a lot of other great shows. Uh, Michael Broderick, he's wonderful. There's just really, really wonderful people in this show, and I'm I'm really excited to be a part of it. So I I, I lived through the first six episodes, so we'll see. <laughs> oh, nice. Spoiler alert! That's great. <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah! Whoops! <laughs> So far, so good. <laughs> oh, yeah. Miss Kim, this is one of my favorite questions we always ask during our interviews. Now, you've done a lot of horror cons throughout your career, and we started asking this question when we had the the wonderful Miss Lisa Wilcox on, and we've had a bunch of sincere and wild answers, so we'd like to ask you, uh, what's your most memorable experience? You know, we've had uh, Kane Hodder talk about people messing with his nipple, so anything uh, you want to tell us is on the table. <laughs> most memorable experience uh, doing what though doing, what, the, com- doing the comic cons doing the comic like cons. conventions oh, oh, oh conventions. at the comic con okay um well I, like i said i love it when people ask me to sign their skin because now i know it's like you're gonna look at this signature all the time um because <laughs> <laughs> i always wonder like what do you do with these things you guys put them up in your room you put them up in your house you sell it uh let's see 
Um, I mean, I, I, I get a lot of requests for me to stab people, you know, just like do a lot of, you know, photographs where I'm where either I'm just getting completely choked out by somebody and then I, I love to, you know, make it look like, uh, you know, like a super <laughs> gag shot. <laughs> Uh, never had anyone tweak my nipples, like, <laughs> hotter, <laughs> feeling really, really, like, anything after that is just going to be a total disappointment. <laughs> uh, no, I mean, that's a good thing. It's a whole different ball game when, when, you know, when that's happened to, uh, to women just r- randomly at those cons. So, so, uh, it's a good thing. A lot of women have said. A lot of women have said, though, that uh, fans like to cop a feel every now and then, though, when they're taking pictures or whatever. Well, yeah. And you and know, don't do it, that. That's not right. Not, don't do that. You know, it's either that or, like, you just get completely slimed by somebody's super sweaty body. Yeah. Oh. And, you know, those convention rooms, they don't really have a whole lot of air. There's no windows to speak of it's like a windowless van with like (laughs) way too many people in costume (laughs) and that's part of it i mean it's not like people are just walking around sweating in a t-shirt and baseball cap i mean people are just you know they're decked out they've got masks on and heavy you know burlap sack costume wear in the middle of august and it's Texas, you know, so I don't know. I think that um, I'm just happy to meet everybody. I kind of probably spend too much time with fans. I'm one of those, like, like people. I know it's wrong. I should change it. <laughs> Maybe I'm just trying to make up for how shitty Kelly Meeker was. Oh, there you go. <laughs> you know, like, I'm trying so hard not to be like, eh, oh, she was just like Kelly Meeker. She totally tried to steal my boyfriend. You know? <laughs> I'm like, no. No, I really didn't. <laughs> I really wasn't. <laughs> so, anyway. so, so back to one of the biggest things we wanted to ask you about besides Kelly Meeker, obviously. Um, you know, you have a book that was just released named I Should Have Been Nicer to Quentin Tarantino and Other Short Stories of Epic Fails and Saves. <laughs> it's available on Amazon, Kindle, Audible. Um, you did the recording yourself. Can you tell audience a little bit about that? What You know, is that what kept you busy during quarantine? Uh, yes, and yes. Um, I recorded it myself with my producing partner, Patrick Leiden, who's brilliant and super super patient uh because it took about three months it's um this is this is not a thin book it's not a pamphlet it's a it's 412 pages wow and or 420 wait how many (laughs) 425 pages uh yeah i didn't read the credits at the end but i did the whole thing uh, except for the forward which was written which was written and read by nick valalonga <clears throat> he's a writer and producer of green book the academy award winning right. uh, writer and producer best picture and best original screenplay um great friend who i did a really lovely film with called corporate ladder anyway but uh, yeah it was a huge um task and it feels like a massive accomplishment i have to say because you know a lot of these things i mean writing books if you're not being paid to write a book that's all self-motivated time energy chutzpah whatever you know grab your shield and go and it, it it takes a lot to do that so Fortunately, I have a lot of self-motivation, but I also have people that really believe in me and, um, you know, fans being part of it. And people have been telling me, please write a book. You have so many cool stories. You know, that's been an impetus. But it really came down to there were things that I really wanted to get out of myself uh, and and just going back and, and looking at my life and, and what what was embarrassing, what what I wish I could have done over, what I, 
you know, if I could do it over again, how would I do it? Those kinds of things. And and it became like a self-help for myself, not really for anybody else, but for me. And I, I think that that's been um, huge. And the Audible was the same thing, to be able to go and, and read what I wrote and do with a, a, you know, an awareness and a, uh, a mindfulness with being able to, um, you know, tell the stories with some pizzazz <laughs> and, and also with, some, with sincerity. So I don't know that you get that as much when somebody else is reading your material, which I think is great, but being able to read your own material and being able to get right. through it. And people love it. So hopefully I didn't bore anybody, but, um, you know, fuck them if I did. <laughs> no, and and you talking about, you know, putting yourself into the book so much. And, and those are the best reads. Those are, you could tell. You can always tell that in stories. Uh, you know, whenever somebody's removed a lot from it, then you can tell. And it's, I'm, I'm very much looking forward to it. Are there, are there any stories from the book that you, you kind of be willing to share as maybe like a sneak peek to everybody or? Well, thank you, Brian. First of all, I really appreciate you um, just it, it, proclaiming that you're going to go and listen to it because that, that first of all, just always makes me feel really great because yeah, it's a crapshoot to go out and, and put all that time and effort into it. But you do want people to listen, like the same right. reason why you're doing this show. You're doing it so people will listen, and you're you're putting your time and effort into it. And uh, yeah, I think it's great to support one another. And um, you don't know what you're going to get out of it. I I I was reading this really wonderful article today. I, I get this uh, this email called the Daily Good, and they highlight certain people. And I'd, I'd gotten that question about what chapter would I want to share. And what, the thing that I read today really reflected one of my chapters called On Looking Up. And this chapter is really dedicated to the fact that we spend a tremendous amount of time right now looking down. You're right. And you know what I'm talking about. Oh, yeah. And it's not just, you know, it's everything. You know, it's uh, it, it's it's going to mess up our our neck alignment, our central nervous system. It's going to wreck our shoulders. It's going to wreck our um, our awarenesses to everything else. And yeah, there, there there's certain advantages to having it for sure. But there's also a lot of advantage right now to placing it down because we've all become addicts and it's it's tough it's a tough one because it's an addiction to our office space it's an addiction to our social space they're combined now so that you know nobody knows anymore where before when the cell phone first came out it was always like, oh my God, put your phone down. We're at, we're at lunch, you know, we're at lunch, we're at right. dinner, we're at, you know, please, we're, we're, can you please not right now? Remember when we were all kind of up in arms, like, oh my God, now right. we're all just like completely freaking resigned. Nobody we're talks to anybody resigned. anymore. Nobody's yeah, calling absolutely. each other on it at all anymore. Nobody says boo about it. And we're losing this. Mm -hmm. We're losing this this discovery of the world around us. And it's not just the discovery, but it's the safety. Yep. It's where you're going, what you're doing, where you're driving, where you're stepping. You know, so for me, like this beautiful, intelligent author just wrote this fabulous book about taking a walk around her city, her New York City block with her dog and her dog has an awareness of, for the city block that she does, you know, multiple times a week that she would have never seen. So it's like dog's eye view. And then she decided, I'm going to do this walk with experts, a lawyer, a geologist, an artist, a designer, a da -da -da, and see what they see. So I thought that was so ingenious of like, you know what? listening to the sounds around us, not just the ones on our ear pods, listening to the 
you know, taking people in when you walk into a restaurant. Where's the exit? The emergency one, you know, like like all those things where you're like, I've got a 16 year old mm -hmm. and this is her life. Right. Is this thing. I can't fight it and I don't want to, but I do want to encourage the time that is necessary to, you know. So in this chapter, I talk about that and I <laughs> see I, I rehash this one story where I'm uh, watching this guy in Beverly Hills, totally entitled, as he should be. He's in Beverly Hills. Right. Um, <laughs> he worked real hard to get there <laughs> from Indonesia or wherever. <laughs> anyway, he's on his cell phone and he's just blasting away and looking at and texting and walking. And I, I see him crossing and then I see this truck coming down a, a hidden alleyway straight at him a linen truck you know that's like two guys and they're like eating their burgers and talking you know and then the guy and the guys like slam on their brakes they almost cla and i was just like oh my god this guy's gonna get creamed and then i see i mean he just keeps texting he doesn't even notice because he's got ear pods in oh, doesn't wow. even notice two poor guys in this linen truck looks like they just soiled themselves and oh, I wow. swear, all I could think was well at least they're in a fresh linen truck <laughs> wow <laughs> that's the beauty of LA <laughs> so everybody that's listening I should have been nicer to Quentin Tarantino and other short stories of epic fails and saves it's a easy title to remember go out and support Miss Kinmont. Thank you. Thanks so much, Brian. Thank you, Nico. You guys are great. Oh, absolutely. I'll, I'll definitely get it on Audible. I'm not. A, I'm not a big reader, but I love listening. It's just. I just. I'm not a big reader, but I do love listening. He like uh, he's the he's the one crossing the street getting hit by linen trucks, but he's listening. <laughs> <laughs> okay. At least you're listening to something awesome on the way out. There you go. Exactly. That's the way to go. Well, you know, what? it's interesting, Nico, because I, I also did the Audible because my daughter is the same way. She she will read a book and listen to it simultaneously for school. That's how she gets all the retention. So there's a kit. You can get it on Kindle because there's a lot of really cool photos in the book, too, uh, at every chapter. Like, oh, yeah, here, like this great photo. That's I mean, you don't want to miss that. Me Absolutely laying on a not. hammock with my Dodger hat on. Johnny Depp shirt on, yeah. Oh my God, with Johnny Depp. That's right. That's right. This is the chapter on hats. Oh, that's a great chapter. Yeah, I know. I met Johnny Depp. This is a great chapter. Yep. That's Check awesome. Doesn't want to meet Johnny Depp. Depp. He's amazing. Because of wearing a hat. You know, people should wear more hats. That's right. Safe from the sun. Uh, Ms. Kenmont, you were uh, kind enough to do a cameo for us a while back, so I'm sure fans can probably still find you there. Uh, is there anywhere else or anything else you'd like to plug or tell our fans about, maybe social media or any other projects maybe coming up? Uh, yes. Um, there's, a, there's a movie called Aloha with Love that will be coming out, um, hopefully on the Hallmark Channel soon. Awesome. That's My with wife will definitely see that. Oh yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. I mean, I was it. just saying, like those Hallmark fans. My goodness, yeah. they're like as they're like horror fans, but oh, flowery. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> they're so devoted and so awesome, and they keep those movies on a loop. It's like it's almost like the shopping network because it's just like so friendly and nice, and doesn't matter. If, the sound is on or anything. It's just like, it's just lovely. It's just like nice and lovely in the corner there. But yeah, Aloha with Love. Um, that's going to be a really fun movie with um, a lot of great people. And <laughs> um, Tiffany Smith, who was the amazing actress from the, uh, the Megan uh, and Harry movie which was a Lifetime film, I believe, that she played Megan. Trevor Donahue, who plays her um, romantic lead, uh, they're great. So it's a beautiful romantic comedy in Hawaii, in Maui, that I got to shoot during COVID. I was like, <laughs> what COVID? Oh, wow, exactly. Until they came at me with the freaking <laughs> Q-tip that was like this long every mm. other day. And I was like, <laughs> oh, that's right. Ugh. 
<laughs> that yeah. test was horrible. <laughs> oh man, you're like, how can you wreck paradise? And they're like, oh, we have a way. I'm like, oh, fabulous. <laughs> Guys were crying in the line as we're saying, because you know what's coming. Right. You know, the guys were just like, they were such losses. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, we all were, but like, it was pretty bad. But nobody got COVID. Everyone was fine, and it was great. Um, what else do I have to plug? Oh, I also have a children's book, Magic and Beauty. Magic and Beauty is a really lovely story about how the world was created by a unicorn and a pegasus. Oh, okay. Awesome. Awesome. You know, <laughs> it's about as close as it's going to get to reality for me right there. <laughs> so, um, <laughs> so there's that. And, yeah, I just, I, I just really want to say thank you to all the super fans and, and devoted fans who have been sending um, – mail and and you know just everybody stay strong stay kind take care of yourself uh don't worry about anybody else's religion or politics or how they feel about any of this stuff just stay in your bubble and do you and uh be flexible and and have have fellowship whether or not people agree with you or not fellowship is fellowship we're all swimming in the same world Right. And get off the world, folks. <laughs> We're all stuck here with each other. Anyway, it's a pretty good world, even though it's a little turmoil. But <laughs> can you imagine what they were saying back in medieval times, though? Seriously. Ooh, that's like, true. oh my God, did you see that Christian got eaten by the lion yesterday? It's like, <laughs> you know, <laughs> that's crazy. <laughs> like, what? No, I didn't see that yesterday. They're like, oh, hell yes. Seven of them, you know. <laughs> Imagine sending some teenagers back to those times with no cell phones like you oh. just mentioned. Yeah. No Let's TikTok. <laughs> there, there are some very creative benefits to all of this. Um, but the narcissism and the endless need for validation and the shaming that comes along with it and the feeling inferior and the, you know, for me, I get kind of like, God, how long do I have to promote myself? It gets exhausting. And why? And do we need to? And then maybe sometimes we just want to be like, hey, you know what? Today's not that great of a day. And then you get like 100,000 people going like, dude, are you okay? And you're like, meh. Well, it's good. It, it, I mean, sometimes people need to have a place where they can throw that line out. That's I agree. Cute. Suicide hotlines are valuable. Are they being created because of social media? Are they, you know, are they more necessary now because of that? I, Probably. But what we, here, here's the thing. For me, it's like as long as you can inspire people to feel confident, because confidence, I mean, a, a, a real confidence, like not fake I mean, like, but give people the the impetus to do the right thing. And, and I don't know. I sound like I'm on a soapbox right now, which I really don't don't want to be. But I, I just I feel like if you if you're given a platform, make the best yeah. out of it. Absolutely. Because no, I'm with the the uh, lack of people skills is very, uh, very depressing to me. Just seeing everybody, you know, at lunch or whatever, don't even converse with the people they're with. They're just looking at their phone the whole time. It's very. It's very upsetting seeing stuff like that. Well, but it's it's isolating, and mm -hmm. and it doesn't allow people to have real human interaction. So maybe instead of being upset about it, just do you put your phone down and take everyone in, and don't don't have really any any attitude about it. Just be like, I'm going to be the one that's looking around. Isn't this unique? <laughs> yes, and everybody else on their phones <laughs> at least i'm taking them in and if something happens i'll be the one to be ready for it or whatever but like it, and and even if you're not there to be security patrol or, or whatnot i just think it's really good for your eyes and and just your whole body system to just 
set it down and just go, I'm going to take 10 super cleansing breaths and just like listen to the world around me and, and take the people in around me and, and come up with my own little backstories for every person I see right now, because that's fun. <laughs> it is. Absolutely. Yes, ma'am. You guys uh, are great. Thank you. Thank you very thank much. Thank you again so very much. For much. Coming this on. was wonderful. Thanks, Absolutely. you guys.